So welcome to session one of um, the Media Sector Development Working Group's uh, panel, online and live panel discussions for this year's IAMCR conference, um, which is on the theme of communication research in the era of neo-globalization, uh, reorientations, challenges, and changing contexts. Uh, we're so happy that all of you um, have taken the time out to, to join us online. Um, the Media Sector Working Group uh, considers the efforts of actors around the globe to shape the laws and institutions that determine how media systems change and develop. These efforts encompass a myriad of activities, including policy advocacy, training and capacity building for journalists, the formation of professional associations, the reform of public service media, among others, and constitutes a field of practice that all of you are very familiar with um, on media development. Um, for IAMCR, we call it media sector development. Uh, and the, this uh, first session today on towards resilient media systems, perspectives from scholars and practitioners uh, really uh, gets at the heart of what uh, we study in the media sector uh, development working group, but media development overall. And uh, we're delighted that we have four papers today. Um, I'll ask each panelist, please, to introduce yourself just briefly and um, share the title of your talk, as well as um, your PowerPoint, if you have that. Um, our partner in this session is the Global Forum for Media Development. Uh, and we're so very pleased that Ivana uh, Vucinich is able to join us and be part of our, our effort. Uh, GFMD has been a wonderful collaborator and partner for our working group. And there are going to be some really great opportunities for members of our working group to get involved in IAMCR's uh, Media Impact Hub, um, as well as if you haven't, you should register for the consulting pool and the international network or database of researchers. Um, when Nick and Seema and Winston Mono from University of Westminster and, and Jairo, um, and I put this working group together. Um, many of the people on this call were part of that journey, but uh, we've now been in existence now, I, I think for at least, how many years, Nick? At least three to five years. We kind of got our informal start at the University of Leicester <laughs> conference many years ago, and here we are today. And one of the main points of our working group is to build collaborations between academics and practitioners and to really provide opportunities, especially for researchers from the global south to uh, be hired and tapped um, by donors, media development, NGOs, governments, and others that are seeking to enhance media development work. And GFMD certainly um, has helped to support that type of collaboration. Uh, Ivana, do you wanna say a few words about GFMD? Yes, of course, thank you, Susan. We are very pleased to welcome you all to this co-organized uh, event today. We are an international network of around now, uh, it's already 120, 120 journalism support and media development organizations. Uh, and our members are working in around 50 countries. We were established, established in 2005 in Amman, Jordan, and we are based in Brussels. Uh, our core values is to support the creation and strengthening of journalism and free, independent, sustainable, and pluralistic news ecosystems as defined by declaration of UNESCO at conferences at Windhoek, Almaty, Santiago de Chile, Sanas, and Sofia. Uh, GFMD's main focus is to ensure proper collaboration as well ex as exchange of information and experience among its members with a view to creating a strong, independent, and pluralistic media environment. 
Now, Susan mentioned something about the International Media Policy and Advisory Center. This is an initiative that was launched last year. It was our pilot year. And the initiative aims to assist donors, funders, policymakers, practitioners, and other stakeholders in making informed, evidence-based, which is important for this group here, I think, um, decisions on strategies, programming, funding, and advocacy for media development and journalism support. This is a collaborative learning and exchange project uh, designed to bring together three groups, three main groups of stakeholders. Uh, our members, which are media development and journalism support groups, donors and funder organizations, and academic and research institutions where IAMCR Media Sector Development Group comes in and they are one of the key partners. I can only reiterate what Susan, Susan mentioned, very important partner for GFMB Impact. And we have a number of initiatives uh, occurring and learning meetings that are happening each year. Uh, these learning meetings range from very large meetings from like 80 to 90 participants to a smaller uh, targeted meetings. And we always try to involve academics and researchers uh, from all around the world. And we have great assistance from IAMCR in that effort, especially also from Global South. And we are very happy to welcome you all here. I also want to mention that the GFMD Impact has a pool of consultants. And if any one of you wants to join our pool of consultants to be involved in research related to media development, please do so. I'll share the link in our, in our chat. And I don't want to take up any of more of our time. I'm very looking, uh, much looking forward to uh, hearing the presentations. Thank you, Ivana. So our, our first speaker is Dr. Anna Jacoby. So over to you, Anna, and you'll have the floor for 10 minutes. Well, thank you very much. I don't know if you're seeing my presentation. I'm really glad to be today with you, uh, hopefully next time in person. Um, uh, what I'm talking today about is um, about media. Uh, one of the panel's uh, questions, which was measuring media development. How do we measure media development? And we're going to try some uh, lessons from the implementation of media development indicators. Um, my interest on this subject is because since uh, 2018, I'm working on a project where I operationalize inter-American standards and freedom of expression into a matrix of indicators and use them to analyze Mexican public policy on freedom of expression. In the frame of this project, I compared three methodologies that I think that can be very interesting for today's question. Uh, one of the questions of the panel was, how do we measure media development? Uh, how can we construct, we, we have several problems here. One of them is how can we construct a worldwide unified and comparable set of indicators that also sheds light on relevant dimensions in the local context. Uh, another problem uh, is how can we overcome the limitations on data collection, especially in countries without a solid cap uh, statistical capacity. And there is one last question, which was really relevant for me uh, studying the Mexican state, which is why should we rely on public sources to measure the state performance, especially in cases where they are reported as the main source of human rights violations? So to overcome or to work on these problems, um, I compare three methodologies. The first one is budget analysis. The second is the UN indicator system. Mainly I will work, of course, with media development indicators. And the third one is um, the standard-centered approach. Uh, it's important to say that these three methodologies are complementary. They are already being implemented by several UN bodies. And there is also an incipient dialogue among especially the two last methodologies. Nevertheless, they arrive to very different indicators. They use different sources, and they adapt very differently to local context and to international human rights standards. Today, I will present these methodologies very, very briefly, and then I will apply them to a concrete case related to public advertising in Mexico. 
So the first one is a budget analysis. Um, I, I'm not going to explain very in detail which uh, what this is. Uh, as some critics say, um, there are um, different ways of analyzing public budgets rather than a methodology. You have several methodologies. It's just different forms of working with the amount of resources allocated by the government to achieve a certain human right. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to show this even in the practice. The second uh, methodology doesn't need a great presentation today. I'm going to, uh, I know all of you know it very well. It's the UN uh, indicator system, in this concrete case, the media development indicator. Um, it is probably the biggest effort to systematize a worldwide set of indicators to measure improvement in human rights, and it has two great advantages. One is it offers a multidimensional rights-based systematization of human rights, and the other one is that it contributes to operationalize the treaty body interpretation, which is very vast and complex. And it combines this analysis with levels and units of measurement, which enable progress tracking, which was the great uh, apportation of, of Paul Hunt. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the history of media development indicators and the UN system. You will probably already know it. And I'm going to uh, concentrate on this last approach, the standard-centered approach. This approach has also been developed under the auspice of the United Nations, and it's very closely related to the UN indicator system. Both approaches pursue the systematization and operalization of human rights and are enshrined into the treaty regime. Nevertheless, they have some difference I would like to share with you. On the first part, they used several sources. Since the UN indicators are conceived as a tool for states to report obligations, they base mainly on statistics generated by the states. And they should only use international sources as means of verification and in absence of, of national sources. On the other hand, standard center approach monitors the performance of countries through international standards. These standards uh, offer a very limited, ordered and systematized corpus and offer a very reliable and high quality information source. A second difference between both uh, last approaches is that they are differently aligned to international standard. The standard center approach uh, takes international standard as a starting point to identify relevant dimensions to operationalize. Uh, since, since the standards change over time, they offer a more dynamic perspective, but in many aspects, they let out of scope everything that isn't already in a sentence, as we as is it the case with digital rights, where we don't have actually standards yet, or very few. And then we have this tension I will later talk about between universality and local ad adaptability of these um, of these uh, two methodologies. Uh, in this second part, I'm going to talk about the indicators we can construct with both methodologies. Um, on the one side, we have a budget analysis. Oh, sorry. We have budget analysis. Um, and we can see things as the expenditure of on public advertising from the Mexican government compared to other countries, which is really huge in amount. Uh, we can also see how concentrated the uh, public advertising is in 10, uh, in the first 10 suppliers that receive half of the publicity. Uh, I would like to have a lot of time to talk about this uh, uh, this slide, but I'm going to have to skip it. Here I show how I uh, constructed every indicator with the three different methodologies. In the second case, uh, it is actually the, the media development indicators, the budget analysis I told you about, and you can see the other in my, my paper. But to finish this presentation, I made as a little um, 
synthesis of it. Um, as you can see, budget analysis uses very different indicators and sheds light on different things. But if you compare some standard-centered approach and media development indicators, both speak about having a legal framework to regulate public advertising with clear rules, with allocation criteria, and with procedures for its application. Um, both talk also about clear information in public advertising without political orientation. And in the case of media development indicators, they are very concerned about misleading advertising. Both talk about having an autonomous body uh, to monitor the allocation of publicity. Uh, and they talk about uh, having fair, transparent, public and non-discriminatory uh, procedures for this allocation. There are two very important differences among the approaches. Um, in the standard center approach, they talk about having sanctions in the legal framework uh, in case that they don't uh, me, uh, use these criteria and the MDIs don't contemplate this. And um, they talk about having explicit and objective parameters for the allocation of publicity, like the size, the audience, profile, the price, and this is not also present in the media development indicators. Budget analysis offers a very different approach and is focused in a very important issue, like the having ceilings or floor for the expenditure on public advertising or having a limit to the concentration of, of public advertising. These two things aren't present in the other two uh, perspectives. And uh, the last two aspects are really very relevant since they, uh, since they, um, uh, since uh, in the in the case of the media development, uh, they talk about limits in advertising content, and in the case of standard center approach, they are against of all forms of content regulation. This is very important within the inter-American system. Um, and there's also a very uh, important difference, which is the role of public advertising when promoting pluralism, media sustainability, and program quality. This is very, very important in the African context, probably, where there are not a lot of resources for the, for the media. But in the, in the inter-American context, they say that states must never use government, government advertising as a subsidy to avoid manipulation, which is a great problem in uh, the inter-American context. Mm. Uh, let me finish with these four conclusions. Uh, each methodology arrives to different but complementary indicators. Uh, the MDI... Um, is a very good methodology to control um, to, uh, to, for state reporting, while standard center approach helps us control the states through observation of special rapporteurs and committees. Uh, MDIs permit a worldwide comparison, while standard center approach adapt better to international human rights standards, to local context, and to changes over time. And last, the standard center approach can overcome limitations on official sources by using a very limited and systematized corpus that offers reliable and high quality information since they are based on an exhaustive doctrinal debate among international courts for the indicators and the observation on UN committees and special rapporteurs for the empirical contrast. Thank you very much. And I hope to have the, uh, later a discussion on, on the paper with you. Thank you so much, Anna. That was really great, very helpful. Um, if you have any questions at this time, maybe type them into the chat or save them um, for the end. Uh, we're going to go through all of the papers uh, before then launching into a Q&A and a discussion. Uh, Nick, did you want to say something? Oh, OK. Oh, clapping thing. <laughs> Great. Our next uh, paper uh, is from Anya and Melanie and uh, Anka. Uh, okay, thank you. 
Um, is it full screen already? Okay, okay, now it is. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, okay, so uh, in our presentation, that's uh, Anke, Melanie and me, Anja. In our presentation, we explore the paradigm of contextualization and local ownership in international media assistance from view angle of uh, structuration theory as it was introduced by Giddens in 1984. And we do argue that local ownership is a well-intended effort to contextualize Western programs in non-Western context. The way that local partners are identified and selected and the way they have evolved into members of the international support or help or aid system themselves is, however, in our view, undermining the intended contextualization. And we will explain how we mean, uh, this is the thesis we are putting up for discussion and we, we will explain what we mean by this. Upfront, a disclaimer, we are not presenting um, empirical research or findings from empirical research, but rather an observation from uh, media assistance collaboration, more precisely a theoretical framing of that uh, observation. And we will have some uh, suggestions for future research deriving from that exercise. Next slide, please. Um, we conceive of local ownership as a strategy to overcome Western normativity in IMA international media assistance from now on IMA. It's heavy reliance on Western-based models and Western-based templates. And as such, local ownership is also a response to an accusation that IMA is perpetuating colonial North-South imbalance of power. Uh, local ownership is also uh, meant as um, improvement of effectiveness of aid programs because the past three decades or so have clearly shown that poorly or not at all adapted Western templates uh, uh, fail to solve local communication problems in non-Western context. Next slide, please. So um, how do we see those two concepts related? Local ownership, in our view, is supposed to allow for media support programs to take roots in the context of intervention. And ideally, contextualization is what derives from that local ownership. Um, next slide. Um, and uh, local ownership um, is as local partners in, in that concept shall take the lead in the design and implementation of projects and, and, and thus allow local knowledge, local culture, local experience inform the design of media support programs. That's not a new discussion, I guess. Ownership, uh, Haslock, um, um, long time veteran in media assistance, uh, accordingly defines ownership as a move away from the paternalistic practice of we know best to a more nuanced approach of you know best. And that quote goes on by saying that requires to place as much emphasis on listening to a local population as on transmitting information to it. So I guess it's safe to say that local ownership has become actually paradigmatic principle in, uh, in international media assistance. Now, if you look at um, local ownership from view angle of structuration theory, it becomes clear that what we're actually striving for in local ownership is agency. Agency is the power of individual members of a social system to strain uh, to um, the power and capability to alter structures in a social system. And structures are rules, habits, routines, norms in that system. They uh, actually emerge from practice. They themselves de determine quite heavily, quite strongly how things are being done in a social system. But agents have an impact on structures too. So the source and driving force for um, change in a social system is actually uh, um, practices that deviate from how things are commonly done uh, in, a, in a social system. In other words, from practice that makes a difference. So, what we're saying is that what we look for in, lo in, in local ownership is actually uh, exactly that, a practice that makes a difference. Next slide, please. 
And the point that we are trying to make in this presentation is that in IMA, we tend to select partners uh, um, from the context from among a small group of like-minded entities, mostly human rights organizations and independent media that share our values, that share the values and concepts with their international partners, mostly also living from these international partners and their funding. In other words, in IMA, we tend to ignore the abundance and the high diversity of different stakeholders in the context and rather focus on that small segment that is common ground with us, that share values, that align and uh, assimilate with international um, standards and or international um, media assistance. In this way, we do avoid the very difference that we were actually seeking for in the first place, hence fostering rather stagnation than change. So contextualization uh, in international media assistance is creating an echo chamber uh, situation in our view. And from here, I uh, um, give the lead to Melanie for the final part of this presentation. Thank you, Anja. So yeah, this echo chamber, which Anja just um, ex explained, is also actually perpetuated and even intensified by the local partners themselves. Um, because when local CSOs get involved in international co collaboration, they are tied to the structures, rules, and routines of international media assistance. And this means by the gain agency through the funding and support on the one side, um, they also give up their political and intellectual um, autonomy and align with the norms and expectations of international media assistance. And they do that in order to safeguard um, the survival of their own um, organizations. Change the slide. So sorry. Um, so this dependency of local um, CSOs on international donors nurtures actually their tendency to emphasize uh, more on the alignment and common ground rather than the differences and contradictions with uh, international media assistance organizations. And this alignment, as we have just explained, Anja has just explained that, uh, creates a problem for the progress and advancement of the system as we understand it with, within Giddens' concept. And such, such an avoidance of difference and deviation um, will not help to mobilize that agency that we are actually looking for. So as Anja already um, introduced, um, is actually further research of, um, of what we did um, with this critical assessment. Um, and our aim of this critical assessment of standard approaches to context is actually to widen the understanding, understanding of uh, contextualization within international media assistance and leads us to further research. And um, we formulated an overall question, which is, um, do local partners become only copies of international media? assistance organizations with their inherent norms and values, instead of being true agents of their local contexts. And uh, in reference to, to further research, um, we think that a deep contextualization is necessary, which includes, um, um, which includes and analyzes the, the complex characteristics of the media context, um, like also area and regional studies do. Um, and they do that by means of multifaceted and qualitative approaches. And we suggest making use of this perspective to collect empirical data to translate our theoretical assumptions into um, empirical research. And first of all, we suggest to um, do a network analysis of international media assistance organizations and their local partners which can then shed light on the actual structures of um, international media assistance, of um, standard types of partnerships and also deviations. So maybe we can find some typologies here. And uh, in addition to that, um, we would inquire local partners about their resources in regard to um, Giddens conceptualization of resources and also their power rela relationships with um, international media assistance organizations which leads us then to a, a deeper understanding where change can be employed. And we also um, want to discuss maybe some research 
uh, qu uh, some questions for, for further research. Um, and we, we see that from both sides. So on the one side, we see that there is a need for contextualization from the perspective of local partners. So we would ask how do local partners perceive problems with colonial practices, Eurocentric concepts uh, in international media assistance? Do they actually see this as a problem at all? And how do partners build bridges between those Western normativities and local contexts? And what does it take to make a program fit to a context? And um, how do they actually handle the frictions, differences, and contradict contradictions with the international media assistance organizations, which we think are there? But um, the interesting question is, how do they handle that? And actually, we can ask um, rather the, the same questions also um, the, the international media organizations, whether they perceive um, um, problems with colonial practices or Eurocentric concepts, how they build the bridges uh, between those um, concepts and how do they handle the frictions and differences with um, their local partners. So we will stop here and thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, definitely a lot to unpack and discuss on this theme of localization. And thank you so much for that theoretical framework to help us think that through. Um, our next presentation um, comes from David Bush and Michael Randall. Over to you, David and Michael. Thank you very much indeed. And hopefully our presentation uh, is actually going to perhaps illustrate a lot of the issues we just heard about in Anya and Melanie's uh, uh, presentation, uh, how they sort of play out in in, in practice. Um, well, hopefully, can you all see that now? So uh, I'm David Lush, I'm Senior Advisor for Organizational Learning uh, at uh, International Media Support. And uh, I wrote the paper I'm presenting uh, today, together with Michael Randall, who's uh, also uh, here today. Um, our, our paper is based on a, a, a knowledge creation and, and learning exercise, which took place within the uh, Protecting Independent Media and for Effective Development, or now better known as the Primed Program, uh, a, a media uh, development uh, uh, program which is being implemented by uh, six media development organizations, um, IMS being, being one of them. And our paper looks at, uh, at, at coalitions um, and what they are, what they do, and how they contribute uh, to, to, to media, uh, media development. Um, so this is what we, have, we, we mean by, by, by coalitions with uh, sort of emphasis added to sort of perhaps highlight um, some of the key factors that, that they're, they're, uh, we see them as, 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 as temporary in that they last as long as it takes to, to reach, uh, to achieve um, a set of common goals, um, which, um, is, is, is done through sort of the collective action of a, a variety of different actors with, with, with different interests. So this is very much about bringing people with different interests uh, together around uh, or, uh, different types of organizations uh, uh, and uh, uh, together to, to uh, and, and, and then coming together around a, a, something of, of shared interest, which they then try to advocate or bring about uh, together. And um, coalitions have sort of been instrumental in pushing for the opening up of, of, of media systems in different parts of the world. Um, we, in our paper, we refer to the, the example of the campaigns for open media and independent broadcasting, uh, which took place in South Africa in the early 90s, which uh, um, really sort of set the ground or, or paved the way for what became uh, the, uh, the, the, a, a very progressive post-apartheid uh, media system uh, within that country. And sort of more, more recently, um, 
coalitions are sort of increasingly seen as a, as, as a promising way to build strategies for survival for public interest media, as many of those uh, uh, many of the spaces for for public interest media uh, are, uh, uh, shrink uh, around the world. And that's been sort of highlighted uh, in the, the CIMA report of 2019, which uh, Nick Benacrista uh, authored. Um, and uh, therefore, for this, it was for this reason that the Prime Programme in, included support for coalitions as part of its strategy to strengthen media resilience to political and economic pressures in, in a variety of contexts. And it was, uh, Therefore, in, 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 in our, 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 we were looking to sort of better understand the processes and uh, that led to the formation and evolution of coalitions. What works, what doesn't work, and therefore what should we as, as media development agencies and our partners, um, what, what sort of approaches should we take? And uh, therefore we, we refer to this as, as, as coalition building. Um, just to sort of set the scene, this is a, a quick overview of the Prime Program. Um, and uh, it, uh, part of the Prime Program, it does have a very strong learning and knowledge creation and learning component because it, it is looking to sort of inform um, and contribute to uh, sort, of, uh, sort of media development policy and practice going forward. And ours is, 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 is one of five learning questions which uh, different members of the, um, the consortium, uh, of the prime consortium are, are, are looking to uh, investigate. So really what, what, what we're talking about, uh, our, our paper is based on what it was in, is in effect up until now being primarily a, a program design process. We were looking to bring together existing learning, knowledge and learning about a coalition uh, building which uh, members of the, the prime consortium had, had had been involved in, and um, and to sort of use that 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 uh, that, that existing knowledge to sort of uh, inform how we uh, design the interventions for for um, the, uh, the, the 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 coalition building initiatives supported by the prime prime program um, in uh, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, and Sierra Leone. Um, so, um, so, so it's, up, up until now, it's not, uh, it's, it's, it's not sort of been based, uh, we, we, we started with a review of uh, evaluation reports uh, to see what we could glean for those and then uh, 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 had a workshop of, of uh, implementing uh, organizations and our partners to sort of make sense of that and to see what uh, what we could uh, take away in terms of how we should approach coalition building within within the prime program. Um, with, as the program goes on in the next year or so, we're, we're, we, we, we see that uh, our monitoring and evaluation will, will give us evidence to how these initiatives are playing out in the, in the program countries. And we hope that this will then uh, further inform sort of media development policy and practice um, going forward. And it was sort of very much with that, as well as this panel in mind, that uh, in our paper, we have taken a very tentative uh, first step of looking at some of the literature outside the media, uh, the media and the media development sector, which might sort of provide us with some uh, points to sort of some sort of conceptual framework for coalition building. So what have we found out uh, so far? Um, well, certainly more coalitions seem to, 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 to fail than those that succeed. Uh, and uh, a very, um, uh, uh, Dr. Haram Mwangi and Dr. Martha Njira's um, uh, uh, study, which we refer to uh, in, the, uh, in our paper, gives a very uh, clear sense of that. Um, and, um, but in, in, in our exercise, we, we were looking at, so in particular, sort of drawing on six examples of coalition building uh, and, uh, that uh, members of the, the, the Prime uh, uh, Consortium have been involved in. Um, we're, we're very much sort of, but because uh, of, of who, you know, we, we sort of identified these ourselves, they tend to be sort of uh, uh, considered more success stories. And certainly 
uh, the impact of these coalitions uh, that we examined uh, have, have had does suggest that sort of coalition building uh, should be taken seriously as a media development strategy. I mean, you had examples of uh, coalitions sort of contributing to constitutional change and the gradual opening up of highly restricted media sector in, in the Zimbabwe, progressive reforms in uh, uh, contributing to progressive uh, law reforms in Pakistan, Zambia, and Kenya, um, effectively pushing back against restrictions in, in, in some of these country, countries, uh, as well as helping to sort of create trust and collaboration between media in what are very polarized and volatile environments. So, so plenty, plenty to be said for, for coalition building. Um, it's far too early to say whether or not the fledgling coalitions uh, the prime program is supporting uh, within Ethiopia, Bangladesh and Sierra Leone are, are likely to have a similar impact. And that's very much because we've, we've sort of found through, through this uh, exercise so far that coalition building does take a, a, a long time. Um, sort of the terms that the, the sort of cut stood out, uh, sort of stand out from the discussions within the, between the partners in, in, in the workshop, uh, participants in the workshop, sort of it's very much coalition of building is about sort of organic growth leading to, uh, with, a, with an incremental approach, which is very much about securing consensus, um, building confidence and bringing, requiring a lot of flexibility. Um, and therefore, coalition building in many respects does run sort of counter to the practice of, of conventional media development organizations like my, mine and the other ones implementing um, uh, the, the, the prime program. Um, so it's, I think that sort of the, the, the challenge was to sort of actually sort of therefore to sort of be to sort of to, to us has been to sort of very much well to sort of not uh, confine, restrict coalition building by our own practices, but rather uh, take what is sort of much more of a, a, or try to create a sort of a very subtle balance between leading and stepping back and allowing national partners to, to set, their, uh, set the agenda to sort of facilitate the kind of uh, local ownership, which uh, Anya and Melanie were, were talking about earlier. This requires nurturing strong and trusting relationships with and between coalition partners and being highly in tune with the development on the ground. Another reason why we need the, 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 the national and, and uh, 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 the coalition members to, to take the lead. Um, having said that, um, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, the, it's 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 sort of very much about sort of uh, 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 coalition building is very much about sort of uh, identifying and focusing on shared interests, uh, uh, and uh, th this is sort of crucial. Uh, but at the same time, sort of striking a balance between a coalition being inclusive. So in some respects, the sort of you, you need different points of view looking at the same issue with, with a shared interest, but looking at a, a, an issue from a different from different perspectives. But at the same time, you need sort of co co people to coalesce to, to, to find where their common ground is and, and therefore sort of striking that balance between being inclusive, but also being very focused um, is, 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 is both a challenge, but also something that uh, is is something that's uh, that's very um, important. Um, but David, mm -hmm. uh, you have thirty third uh, time to wrap it up, so thirty seconds or okay. so. Great. So, um, need, needless to say, that uh, no co two coalitions are the same, but we think we have do have the makings of of what might be a model for coalition building, and we've sort of outlined that in our in our paper. Um, in terms of that, we'd sort of like to sort of, it's very much about two step, one step forward and two steps backwards. And therefore the, what you can see, maybe see in there, the, the feedback loops and how you build that into a model is both challenging, but in this case, very important. And we did think that uh, uh, we sort of, of the coalitions we were certainly looking at were perhaps this sort of hybrid between sort of more conventional 
uh, advocacy, ad advocacy coalitions, uh, and also then social movements. There was a sort of a mix of, of both in there. Um, and uh, therefore we sort of point to sort of some, some of the literature that might help us sort of uh, uh, take this sort of uh, theory a, a, a bit further, further and, and develop sort of firmer concepts around coalition building. So really what I, if, if we're in, in the conversation that follows, I'd like to hear from you is, you know, what, what you think we've overlooked, but any practitioners out there, does any of this make sense? And how might it be of use to you and uh, to, to the academics? Does this topic actually warrant any further research? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thanks, Michael. Um, definitely uh, very helpful to think about coalition building and social movements and something that I hope we can uh, return to in the Q&A, if not um, in, in further discussions with GFMD and Primed. Uh, but without further ado, we have one more paper um, before we can open it up for Q&A. So over to you, uh, Hannah Jemmer. The floor is yours for 10 minutes. Hi, uh, thank you. I will try to share my screen. Uh, do you see it? And if I do this, is it full screen? All right. Um, so thank you for having me. I'm very happy to to take part. Uh, I'm Hannah Yemmer. Um, I'm a junior researcher at Tallinn University. Um, and um, my the title of my paper uh, then is Analyzing and Developing Media Systems Beyond Neoclassical Economics uh, Thinking. Um, I hope you see the next slide. Um, so the structure of the talk. So first, I try to give a quick introduction of what the aim is, so the research, research question and the background, so the re relevance of this. Uh, then I go briefly into uh, how neoclassical and heterodox economics view innovation. Uh, then I introduce um, some newer frameworks to think about uh, data-driven innovation in legacy media organizations. Uh, so mainly innovation commons and cross innovations that adhere to ideas of heterodox economics. And then I offer some operational tools that could be uh, perhaps uh, explored by media organizations, legacy media organizations themselves, which are then open data, uh, blockchain technology, and agent-based modeling. And then I try to uh, briefly conclude. But then uh, the research question is, how can heterodox approaches to media economics contribute to improving our understanding of data analytics related or data-driven innovation in legacy media organizations? And by heterodox approaches, I mean everything besides neoclassical um, economics. And by legacy media organizations, uh, I mean mass media organizations with editorial independence. Uh, so radio, TV, uh, news, um, and their online uh, versions in, in this age of digitalization. And, and the background to this is datafication and platformization. So there are a few platforms in the world dominating the information distribution. Um, uh, so they gather both personal data, open data, combine it, manage it in smart ways uh, to benefit uh, privately, to profit from it. Um, and this has resulted in their competitive edge. However, they lack in editorial responsibility and they have taken over as content um, uh, distributors and also the ad markets. So they function as multi-sided uh, markets. So then legacy media has uh, lost their ground. And when it comes down to data, it makes sense to ask 
how does legacy media use data for uh, innovation? How could they then raise their uh, competitiveness? Um, and this um, comes down to issues of neoclassical and heterodox approaches to understand innovation. Uh, so neoclassical approach um, focusing on uh, microeconomic uh, organization of uh, let's say media organizations and when we take these global platforms they very much focus on uh, creation of private value so being profitable uh, privately and uh, this is driven by having share shareholders and their interests that expect short-term uh, benefits and returns. Uh, also, uh, they talk about rational choice, but uh, as we know, markets are very complex. And so the factors to take into account um, are impossible. Uh, so in the end, uh, we can't really talk about rational, rational choice. And uh, network externalities uh, as well. So something they say that the invisible hand uh, organizes on the market, uh, then complexity economics in the heterodox approaches say that these are just factors that we are uh, at the moment not able to um, map and pinpoint. Uh, so, in a, in a sense, this is the, uh, some of the shortcomings of neoclassical approach. Uh, but then why, when we talk about legacy media, why does it fit better uh, with heterodox approaches? Because it allows for public value to occur uh, more easily, because traditionally legacy media organizations have had this dual role of uh, being uh, profitable, but at the same time, informing the public, uh, being the fourth state, having codes of conduct for journalists, um, having uh, presenting diverse views. And uh, also when we talk about innovation, then heterodox revolutionary economists say that innovation is the driver um, uh, for growth and development. Um, so this is a process that should be looked into uh, more deeply uh, while neoclassical approach focuses mainly on inputs, outputs, investments, so has kind of a simplified linear uh, view. And then complexity uh, economics adds this dynamism and, and, and complexity to it, saying that there are these factors that we can't account for at the moment, but basically it could be done so we have a fuller uh, picture of what is going on and can therefore maybe uh, prepare um, or, or, or be ready for uh, or, or sort of innovate better as legacy media organizations and institutional economics saying that culture and the rules within um, the media organization and around it also uh, are very important in determining how innovation happens. Uh, so these concepts of innovation commons and cross innovations um, so, as I said, they adhere to uh, these ideas in heterodox economics. And first is Innovation Commons uh, by Jason Potts. Uh, and he bases his work largely on Eleanor Ostrom's uh, commons. And uh, what he uh, basically says is that it's uh, bottom-up processes, so activism and enthusiasm on the micro level when people with different expertise come together um, to, to face an issue and then gathering and coordinating, uh, overcoming uh, uh, these problems. And as it is a bottom-up process, then it has this democratization element uh, to it. And uh, of course, there are rules. Uh, so there needs to be monitoring, sanctions, internal organizational rules, so that there would be no uh, free riding and that everyone would uh, both use the resources and then share uh, the benefits in the end. Uh, the second concept is cross innovations. Uh, by Indra Kibros, um, and what he refers to is cross-sectoral collaboration. 
Uh, so when um, Potts talks about uh, in one sector, people with different expertise coming together, then Ibros talks about different sectors, public sector, academia, uh, NGOs, uh, startups, media organizations, corporations um, coming together, uh, and also with other sectors, health, education, uh, to create these new value uh, propositions. Um, and so, but it also has this bottom-up um, uh, characteristic in it as well. And what they both say is that it is not so much, uh, the, or it's not only the issue of investing in innovation, but the coordination of it is, um, if not the most important thing, then a very uh, important factor in there. So this phase zero of knowing what the problem is and gathering different expertise. Um, now, one minute left. Oh no! We don't need to start <laughs> wrapping up. Yeah, sorry. All right, I'll try to be quick. Sorry. So these operational tools, so open data, usually governments provided data. So having this public value mindset, uh, they they provide data to the public, uh, also to the media sector, uh, to have uh, different organizations, individuals collaborate. So if they don't have their own data, they can uh, use uh, open data. And instead of um, uh, economies of scale, they can have economies of scope. And blockchain focuses very much on trust and decentralization. So in a way, uh, fits this uh, bottom-up um, coordination uh, where you know you, you know and you can trust the counterparts and you can have decentralized autonomous organizations to kind of organize the issues practically it might uh, become relevant in rights management because it can be a messy environment in creative industries so knowing who owns exactly what makes uh, payments easier so something to consider agent-based modeling so having agents their relations and the environment with the rules and regulations mapped uh, can show how micro level uh, this uh, behavior uh, in data driven innovation in the media legacy media organization can lead to or lead to patterns of innovation so there when you can pinpoint different characteristic uh, factors and you run the simulation many, many times, you can see which factors are maybe the most relevant for uh, new ideas and innovations to occur. And in conclusion, um, I argue that heterodox approaches are valuable uh, to see and analyze legacy media organizations and their data related innovation processes. And uh, the principles within all these approaches are openness, decentralization, transparency, trust, and dynamism. And the most important thing here that is that the public value to occur. Thank you. Thank you very much. A very interesting and unexpected complementary um, alignment with your paper, Hannah and Anna, the paper that you gave. <laughs> it's interesting to think about them together. Um, Nick, I wondered if you could jump in and offer a few observations, comments, and maybe a bold question or two, and then we'll um, have just a bit of time for open Q&A. Thanks, uh, thanks, Susan. And thanks everybody for, um, for excellent, really excellent presentations. It's always, um, I'm reminded every year uh, of why it's so important for us to do this at the IMCR. This is one of the few, this is the only space where we really have this kind of intellectual conversation around media development and it's desperately needed um, because the, the challenges that are faced practically, actually they really do need all hands on deck. We really need the help of researchers to sort through the complexity of these issues. Um, so uh, a couple of quick comments uh, before I open it up. Um, for Anna, you know, I think this uh, really intrigued by, I think the, conclusion that you're reaching about standard-centered approaches being perhaps, uh, what I gleaned from it, maybe our best opportunity for uh, kind of contextually driven, impactful measurement of media development. So uh, I think terrific. Um, I had a question for you on a more prosaic issue, which is on the regulation of 
uh, advertising. So just in Argentina, they've passed some national legislation regulating uh, the transparency of government advertising, hoping to move that to the municipal level. This seems to me an issue that we haven't really elevated to the international level. And I'm curious to hear if you see in Mexico or elsewhere in Latin America, a movement towards greater transparency and whether this is something that we can uh, you know, build upon and draw more attention to internationally since it's such a huge issue. Uh, for Anya, Anke, and Melanie, I would say um, I have a number of, there's a number of comments in the text, in the chat that I think are worth considering. I think there's a couple of things and, and that you might wanna revisit in the framework. Looking at project design and implementation is already narrowing your definition of agency. It's a very thin form of agency already. So deciding what the priorities are, deciding what a media system should look like, that's agency. And so I think the framework already departs from a point of uh, denying agency to partners. I don't like the term local partners. I mean, unless you're talking about someone who's working in Mandera, it, you know, if they're based in Nairobi or Buenos Aires, they're probably regional, if not international, certainly, you know, national. Uh, local, I think, you know, from my standpoint, has always been the, the very small community-based organizations. So being clear about who you're talking about, I think would be helpful. And then, you know, I think that the role of the intermediary, you know, I, your framework seems to suggest that who you pick uh, as a partner has implications for agency. But look, inter, you know, intermediaries, we know, take 90 or 80% of the resources and determine very much the uh, objectives, the priorities, and the mission. So I think looking at this framework, structuration is great, uh, but looking at it in the absence of the broader political economy of media, which frankly denies, a, which itself denies a great deal of agency. I think is, is misleading in the sense that it, it almost sounds like you're blaming the local partners uh, when I think it's the incentives and frankly, the, in, in, the intermediaries. We need to look at much more critically. With all due respect, you know, uh, to the great work that they do, but you know, the IMSs and the internews, uh, you know, local or national partners have very little agency. Turning to, in that, in that structure, um, and I'm sure Roja and others will talk about the importance of bringing in uh, non-Western forms of theory into this, which I think is really a good point. Um, on the coalitions for change, I do think this actually, these, these two papers do speak to each other. So supporting coalitions to set priorities for reform, uh, to kind of create a vision for what a media system should look like, that to me is a movement towards real agency. Um, for David, I would say your presentation in your paper, I think is, is really clear and very practical, but would benefit from a little more sort of theoretical and academic rigor. There are questions of agency and power that are central to this, including within the coalitions. You know, oftentimes you get to a country and you have uh, the, the journalist associations captured by a few key actors and it does you know there's there's power dynamics within those coalitions there's power dynamics as a implementer or as a donor coming in and deciding who to support these are really difficult things to unravel um, and i think actually you're right in looking to social movement theory as it's been adopted in other practices of media development and, and development including participatory approaches to development there's a lot there that we can bring on in a really rich literature that I think we can help to strengthen uh, from the perspective of the media sector. Um, and then finally for Hannah, uh, really interesting, but I'm, I struggle to, the thread, I, I was really struggling to draw a thread between the abstract theory that you're looking at and the world that we work in and live in. So I, I think for me, it was just, you know, in this group in particular, I think we are trying to build a praxis. Uh, and, and I think you have some really evocative and interesting ideas that you're bringing from heterodox economics, but I couldn't quite understand how we might, in a praxis between practitioners and academics, how we might operationalize the, these heterodox theories. So that would be my challenge to you. But thanks, everybody. This has been a really rich conversation.
Wonderful. Well, wow. thank you, Nick. That was really helpful and amazing. You were able to do that so quickly on the fly. So thank you. Uh, we have time for a few questions or responses from the panelists. Uh, we have a great uh, discussion going on in the chat. Um, does anyone have um, any burning questions that they would like to ask to the panelists? Just unmute and go for it if you do. Uh, Naomi? Yeah, I did put my hand up. Maybe you can't see it. Um, I, I see you now. <laughs> Thank you. I'll lower my hand. Um, OK, I want to come back to the structuration paper, which, I mean, for all the critiques of uh, Giddens and Fabiola's comment in the chat, which I totally appreciate, I think the missing brilliant thing in that paper is the thing about resources, right? Because it depends, what do you mean? It draws, that's the beauty of theory is make you think and look for things. What do we mean by resources? So this idea, the hierarchy of authoritative and allocative resources is really important to think through. Um, and I think um, that it, it, it um, the possibility of, of, as highlighted by David and Michael in their paper of a hybrid between, um advocacy and social movement makes you think that you know actors on the ground whether wherever they are local national regional um by coming together what kind of resources are they bringing or uh, you know are they managing are they able to exploit that can benefit you know the, the sort of the coalition generally or the project or whatever it is it's just i i you know everybody's talking sort of structure agency and rules and and but i just wanted to highlight this issue of resources and what exactly do we mean maybe i mean anya and melanie could come back and say a bit more what they mean about um allocative and authoritative resources i think i know what they mean but i just think if we think of it in practical terms it may have more sort of resonance in terms of um, coalition building and you know multiple actors operating together. Any responses from the panel? Hmm. Hi. Um, Anya, <laughs> Anya is actually our um, um, expert on on the on the theoretical um, part. So I wonder whether um, she wants to jump in. Um, but maybe from my side first. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for the comments. I, I think it's very helpful also on uh, on the uh, theoretical um, concept and. Uh, maybe also on uh, the the comment of Roya, of course, um, this is something we we um, we plan to do, right? So um, those questions and further research we have in mind is uh, uh, not meant to be um, from a Western normative perspective. So I mean that would not undermine everything we, we've just said. Um, and regarding the resources, um, this is actually what we thought we, we should, uh, we need to find out with um, more um, empirical data on that. So what kind of resources do um, partners actually have when they work together with um, international media uh, assistance organizations? Um, and um, so that, that is rather the next step, so to say. Um, Anki, do you want to um, add something? Um, is Anke, shall I jump in quickly? Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks for your comments on the um, uh, on, on our presentation. Um, to um, uh, to the question of of um, that uh, Nick raised regarding the the intermediaries or who's to blame for this. I mean, I don't think that anyone is really to be blamed. That wasn't the purpose of the of the presentation at all. It's just that it's our just our observation that everyone is seeking for 
um, uh, um, this similarity, the assimilation, the like-minded, the shared values. So, um, and that was the point of our presentation and that's what everyone does together. It's just that it, it's totally and understandable because it allows projects to run smoothly. It allows programs to run smoothly if it's um, organized and managed among like-minded partners. But what we um, what we uh, miss out and we, we, we don't seize the opportunity for innovation um, if we focus on shared values and common ground. And, and uh, that is something we do together. I don't think that any party is to be blamed here. It's just that effectiveness um, uh, for, for projects and pro programs to run smoothly drives that tendency. But if you want to change and advance and programs the systems, if you look for more uh, for deeper contextualization, then we uh, have to focus and dedicate resources to exploration of difference, of friction, of contradiction, of practice that makes a difference. And that is where, um, uh, where the argument goes to. And that is also an answer to the question about resources. We cannot change the fact that resources are allocated asymmetrically between the North and the South, that's obvious. But we can um, organize that the, the allocation of resources and can redirect it to explore and focus more on difference and friction rather than alignment and, and shared grounds. Um, and that that's, um, uh, yeah, that would be my, my comment on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Anna and then Hannah, and then I think we're gonna need to conclude because we have another session coming up. Susan, just uh, to uh, clarify, I think people are asking about the link for the other session. It's not the same link, right? If you can share it in the chat for all those interested to join you for the other session. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, well, I think there are some uh, transversal issues in this panel, uh, which is the articulation to local actors, uh, as David points out, and to local interests as Anya, Anke, and Melanie point out, and in my case, to local problems and local regulation frames. So I think this panel is um, very relevant right now because we are seeing that media development is perceived in Mexico and in many countries as a foreign intervention, intervention which is something we didn't see with, uh, in the past. So I think now it's more important than ever to have this um, great articulation to local context and local actors uh, that we saw in the different papers. And very briefly uh, concerning the question uh, of Nick, thank you, thank you very much for your question. Um, the regulation of advertising is something uh, we had in different initiatives since 2005, where it started the problem of regulation of public advertising uh, in the media program of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation, we really pushed this uh, through uh, projects uh, of Fundar, uh, Asociación de Derechos Civiles, etc., and talking to legislators and so on. So it was really on the debate, especially, let's say, 15 years ago. Um, and it continued in Mexico, it was 2018 that it finally had a regulation. But the problem with this regulation is that they are simulations because they leave outside key indicators. This is why it's so important to have these key indicators like sanctions if you don't uh, comply uh, with, the, with the standards or objective criteria for the allocation like price, audience, etc. So this is why it is so important um, to have indicators that are articulated to the regional uh, uh, standards. So we can avoid that we have things that work in another regional context, but not in, let's say, in Latin America, or it works here, but it doesn't work in Africa and so on. So um, I think this is a great question. and. Um, the importance of these indicators we're all talking about is to measure how effective this regulation is, because uh, you can have great uh, regulations, but if you don't have the proper indication uh, indicators, they just it's just useful. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Hannah, you have the last word. Oh no, too much pressure. <laughs> Uh, but uh, yes, uh, thank you. I've, I've also enjoyed this panel a lot. Uh, I understand that we've uh, dwelled around issues of collaboration, localization, and measuring development uh, in media. Um, and uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, I've been wondering about the same thing: how to tie theory with uh, with practice. Um, and uh, on one side, I find that it's, it's very important that when we test these ideas, we em embed uh, this in, in theory as well. Uh, but uh, one of the things that I plan to do next is also that I interview different uh, media organizations, different sizes, different sort of expertise, different collaborations. And I've been actually testing these questions in more practical ways and bringing them examples as well, how this could be in a way operationalized and their knowledge of all these technological possibilities and whether it matches with uh, their uh, ideas on, on how to innovate. So in a sense, it's a work in, in prog progress indeed, uh, but uh, working uh, towards, uh, yes, more practical uh, ways of uh, approaching this. So thank you. Wonderful. Well, I wish we could stay on longer and continue discussing and debating these things, uh, but hopefully we can stay in touch. Uh, if you are not part of our listserv for the Media Development Researchers Network, uh, get in touch with Nick or I and we can add you to those lists. Um, please do stay in touch with the Global Forum for Media Development. And uh, if you're joining us for the next panel, um, see you in about 12 minutes. Uh, so without further ado, our session one is concluding now. Thank you for joining us. And we hope to see you in person at the IAMCR conference next year, wherever it will be. Right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone.